So welcome to another virtual DevOps for Defense. Uh, this month, we are going to talk about scaling services in the cloud, and we've got Vadim uh, here to talk to us again. I think this makes Vadim, uh, puts him ahead of me in giving 2020 presentations. Uh, last time, Vadim talked about Shift and their, dev, their DevOps process and, uh, and how they do continuous delivery. I thought it was really, really cool. And, um, and Vadim's going to talk about, he's, he's moved into a, a, a different uh, company, a different role, uh, and is dealing, is working at a, at a whole new scale. And so I, I asked him to do a talk on scaling for us because I think what we can learn from the commercial space um, is incredibly valuable for us. Uh, the, the things that we scale for will probably be different. But the techniques that we scale with will probably be the same. Whether where where Vadim will be scaling for simultaneous uh, users, uh, we might be scaling for uh, number of track reports or something like that. Um, I think the fundamental principles uh, are are valid and apply, and I think there's a lot that we can learn here. Uh, go ahead to the next chart, please. So. Our, our code of conduct, we always talk about it. Um, obviously, this is an unclassified session, so uh, no dirty words. Please do treat each other with respect and professionalism. Please uh, do not talk about your private, sensitive, or proprietary work. Your secret sauce is yours. Um, but do please you know, talk about your experiences and your needs, uh, your desires to improve uh, the, how we do work in our domain, share your thoughts and learn from others. And as always in our virtual context, um, to respect our speaker, please do mute yourself while others are speaking. Um, that said, Vadim, I, I hope you'll welcome uh, comment or question as we go through your talk. Oh, absolutely, yes. Standing. I don't want to be the only person talking. Please ask questions. Please let's have a discussion. That's much more interesting. Okay, outstanding. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Vadim. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, JD. So my presentation today is uh, scaling services in the cloud. And first, I'm going to start talking a little bit about, about myself. So I, I've been living in Madison, Huntsville since 96. Uh, so first 20 something years, I was working in the defense industry, NASA and DOD. And last three years, I moved into commercial and uh, web development, backend web development. So just like you, I have experience uh, working with dozens and hundreds of users. But once you go into uh, commercial web, you have to deal with hundreds of thousands of users. Or if uh, and, uh, a new job, uh, so I just started a month and a half ago, uh, they're dealing with millions of users. So it's a totally different scale. and. Um, Totally different set of problems, essentially. So since I'm talking about scalability today, first I need to define what is scalability. So scalability is ability of a process network or software to grow and manage uh, increased demand for complexity. Uh, there are multiple ways to scale. So first one is a scale vertically. That's when you add more resources to an existing instance. For example, you add more CPU, memory, GPU, whatever you have. Uh, then you can scale horizontally. That means you're adding more instances of the same type. Uh, diagonal scaling, of course, is just a combination of the two. And global scaling, something that you can do with um, uh, cloud providers, something like AWS, uh, you can add another region. That's a uh, scale across regions. Uh, just, uh, I'm sure you guys all know, but I just want to remind you what Moore's law is. Uh, it was a 1965 forecast that the number of components on integrated circuit would double every year. And uh, it was revised in uh, 1975 to double of transistors on a chip every 18 to 24 months. Uh, but while in reality, uh, since uh, 2010, it has been two and a half years, uh, rate continues to slow down. And more importantly, single core performance improvements have been nearly flat uh, over the last few years. Uh, due to uh, heat uh, dissipating issues. So recent CPU improvements are really in an uh, increasing number of cores. So we are, in reality, we're always talking about horizontal scaling and we're talking about scaling. So 
that brings up to the next, next question. Does cloud computing provide some limited scalability? And from a horizontal scale, scaling perspective, it actually does. Uh, of course, AWS or Google Cloud or DigitalOcean, they don't have unlimited resources. But from a pers your perspective as a customer, they do, because they uh, typically have enough capacity to support 10 x of your particular load for you as a customer. So horizontal scaling, yes, it's unlimited. Global scaling, it's limited number of regions. AWS has uh, four regions in the United States, so that's really a limit of four in US. Uh, vertical scaling, no. Uh, cloud providers could provide unlimited vertical scaling, then uh, of course this presentation will just have one slide. Use vertical scaling, don't worry about anything else. Buy more CPU, buy more memory, be done with it. Don't worry about things. Uh, Vadim, a quick question. Yeah. When yeah. we talk about unlimited scaling horizontally, um, does that require unlimited budget? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I have more slides about that uh, later in the talk, but yes, if you, have a, if you have unlimited budget, you can buy unlimited number of uh, yeah, similar, to be the, the same uh, CPU instances. Uh, virtual machines essentially from cloud or you can build your own private cloud as well but sure. again it should still be horizontal scaling limited by your dollars and uh, number of instances that you can buy okay thanks sure. so prior to scale let's talk about those building a web service so before we can scale something you have to build it right and uh, as you can see on the image that's how it typically works customer explained what he wants project management identifies something else at least designed it uh, what was built is completely different support customer support was never priority to start with uh, marketing has promised completely different things i mean you guys know what it means but that's why it's very important when we start to start with a monolith so monolith is a single application, way easy to start, and it's connected to a single web store. Uh, since I'm talking about cloud and commercial web services, I'm talking about single uh, database, but if you're talking about engineering application, think about your um, uh, single software application that all your engineers are working on. That's uh, your computing instance, for example, uh, for all your uh, calculations. So are monoliths really that bad? Uh, they do have a lot of very good pros, very easy to start. So all uh, software systems typically start as monoliths. Uh, because it's very easy to start, very easy, very easy to do EOC and start to grow your business. Uh, very easy to add new developers at the beginning. Very easy to deploy. You don't need to worry about DevOps if you have a single uh, shared uh, code base. You have a single repository, you don't worry about things, you just, Single deploy, easy. Uh, easy ex to exchange data between modules because you don't worry about networks, don't worry about anything like that. Uh, but cons is that it doesn't scale because um, if one of your uh, modules require additional um, resources, you cannot scale it independently from the rest of your uh, code base. Uh, maintenance becomes nightmare as your team grow. If you have three developers working on the same code base, it's one thing. If you have 50 developers working on the same base, Always. That's a big problem. And it's also a single point of failure. Even if a uh, small tool goes down, which is part of your monolith, your system goes down, you're out of luck. Um, Let yeah. me ask you on the monolith question uh, side of things. Do you, have you seen or, or have any lessons learned in terms of, um, I, I think I agree with you, you want to start and build your proof of concept and know that you're solving the right problem. But at, how long can you survive without creating so much technical debt that it becomes um, almost an un unrecoverable situation? How long can you stay in that monolith and, uh, and, and still succeed? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, it depends uh, how fast you're growing. As soon as you notice that you're growing, you have to immediately start working on a better solution. Uh, but your better solution don't uh, work on replacing your existing system. 
take parts of your system and replace uh, against, let's say, along the edges, uh, essentially. Uh, identify your biggest bottleneck, then replace your bottleneck and start grow and replace this uh, bottleneck with a microservice. Like I will talk later on about microservice. Uh, but at the same time, you can start uh, too early because you, if you don't have a proof of concept, if you don't have that mind stream or your government contracts flowing in, there is no reason to, uh, uh, basically, you're, basically worry about premature optimization as well. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you have to be considering of balls. You have to consider premature optimization. You have to consider technical debt, and there is no right or wrong there. Uh, it's it, it's like it's one of those where it depends. You don't want to be too early or too late. Yeah. So you want to to summarize. I think you're saying you, you really want to avoid complexity early, and and incrementally add the complexity needed to scale um, based on demand, based on what what you absolutely have to do um, and, and then focus on those bottlenecks, obviously kind of the uh, theory of constraints approach. That's correct. But reality is at the beginning, you will be forced to add all the features. Hmm. That's uh, it happens is you're working for government or you're working for commercial. Uh, when you're at the beginning of your contract, you want to add features, not mm -hmm. because it's good, but because that's the only way to grow your business. It's the only way to get your money for your next contract. It's the only way to prove, yeah, they can do it. Yeah, we all agree. Look, I mean, not the right technical thing to do, but that's the only business uh, thing to do. It's the only correct business thing to do, and that's why you will, once you'll build that technical depth. And you're right. The longer you're working on your monolith, the more technical depth you're gonna build. Uh, that's why it's very important to uh, build your monolith, get your proof of concept, get your next government contract or your uh, money from your investors and then start uh, splitting the chop and move to microservices. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, database, that's typically uh, uh, becomes a bottleneck because it's a single instance. So unlike uh, monolith, which we can still horizontally scale, we can run 10 monoliths, 20 monoliths, it's gonna cost us more money because we're gonna run big instances of that monolith. We cannot scale database, the single, uh, it, suppose, it should run on a single server. And my major issue with uh, relational databases especially, is that it has maximum number of available connections. Postgres uh, opens a new process which consumes CPU memory and file descriptors. So sooner or later, as your company grow, you're gonna outgrow your database. And even the biggest AWS RDBMS instance is not gonna handle your increased workload. Because there is a limit. Because you're gonna, uh, add more uh, horizontal instances of your monolith and they're all gonna consume connections from your database. And at some point, your database just goes down, literally goes down and uh, you need to start thinking of how to repair and solve the, solve the problem. So what do you do then? Like, just like we talked about a second ago, uh, the only way to move forward is really transition to microservices, which means take your monolith and uh, cut pieces, modules out of it. Typically you start uh, at the boundaries or at the most uh, used uh, parts of your code. Uh, and like on the picture, I mean, don't go directly to microservices because there will be dragons in the way. So you cut on the, uh, uh, you identify your boundaries. You already have experience working with monolith, what your system is. And so you go, you do the split and then you move to a uh, microservices pattern. Uh, it's essentially the same uh, pattern that uh, all uh, big companies are using, like Google, Amazon, whatever. They're also using the same microservices pattern right now, which is a client talking to API Gateway, which talks to a collection of microservices. And uh, which is most importantly here, each service has its own data store. So they're all independent to each, from each other. And if one service goes down, system can continue to operate. Maybe it's reduced capacity, but it still continue to operate. Uh, if you are working on uh, government defense, think about that. Yeah, your soldier is out on the field. Yes, yeah, some part of his hardware might not be operational, but you can still maintain the rest of uh, hardware to operate. Uh, so major reasons for moving to microservices, remove data store bottleneck, because each microservice has its own data store, thus it 
uh, once you uh, move data store to each microservice, you remove the uh, bottleneck. Uh, you solve Conway law problem. As you guys know, any organization basically mimics uh, system design mimics uh, organizational uh, structure. And with Monolith, uh, it's, which is a great solution for small organization, as it continues to grow and more teams start to add uh, things to the same code base, it becomes a disaster essentially because uh, you have a code base that everybody is responsible for and nobody is responsible for. And when nobody is responsible for, it's a big pile of trash that there breaks all the time and it's a disaster. And uh, when you're moving to microservices, it's also another chance to clean up your legacy code. Uh, like we just talked, I mean, uh, at the beginning, you will be adding a lot of features, you'll done a lot of proof of concept. Uh, when you're splitting to microservices, you already know your domain, you know your customers, clean it up, remove features that become unnecessary at this point. Uh, but microservices brings their, brings their own challenges. It's not a free launch. There are issues with uh, network reliability and latencies. Uh, data needs to be duplicated. It's something that not that easy to understand, but once you have a single data store, it's one thing, you don't worry about data duplication. Once each microservice has its own data store, you occasionally have to duplicate data. So it's your costs uh, will go up because of that. Uh, you need to worry about orchestration. So you have a bunch of services you have to orchestrate, how they're uh, uh, deployed. Uh, integration of those microservices becomes an issue. Observability, uh, you need to know how your request uh, goes from service to service to service. There is a need for API gateway. So API gateway is a, it's unified point entry into a system that essentially hides uh, backend implementation from your uh, customers, from your web client. Uh, front end only calls API gateway and then back end uh, that's responsible for proper routing and all that stuff. Uh, and it's also, it, while it does all of those cool things like authentication, uh, security, BFF, it's also another piece of architecture to maintain, which means uh, you need to have more engineers working on your code base at this point. Uh, at the same time, when you move to microservices, you have to build your DevOps culture. Uh, you have to start building your DevOps team because running microservices scale is much harder than dealing with monolith. You have to have multiple deploy pipelines. Uh, you have to have uh, container orchestration. Uh, you have to have integration tests. You have to continuously run integration tests on every deploy. Because just because you change something in your service, it might affect other services at the same time. You have to have infrastructure monitoring. Because at this point, you don't have a single data store. You have multiple data stores. So you have to manage those database instances. You have to manage your costs. Like we talked to you earlier, costs are very important. And developers have tendency to create cloud resources and forget about them. It's really easy to create a cloud resource. It's not that easy to uh, go clean it up later on. So you have to constantly monitor your infrastructure in order to prevent those losses. And the DevOps team typically is responsible for managing logging, tracing, telemetry solutions. Hey, Vadim, there was a question that came through. Um, how do typical microservice implementations communicate to each other and the API gateway? Is it a broadcast? Is it a multi, multicast bus? Is it a IP? Are there, are there patterns for that, that interaction? Yeah, absolutely. There are patterns, uh, API gateway, uh, typically interacts with microservices. Uh, most uh, often it's a REST API call. So it's a web call, HTTP call. Um, if you want a higher performance, you can look, there is, a, well, it's a new technology, but it's a gRPC. Of course, a more procedure call been around for a while. So I can't say it's really that new. But uh, there is a movement towards uh, making API gateway to call uh, services via gRPC. Uh, there is also a technology called WebSockets. It's not widely used, but it can also be a possibility to open a WebSocket between uh, API Gateway and Web Service and maintain a continuous connection. But for simplicity, most companies are using uh, HTTP calls, mm -hmm. while and some are moving, moving to gRPC. Yeah, and if you're using HTTP and REST, then you can use simple open source um, implementations of your, your gateway and your ingress. Yeah, and most uh, 
API gateways provide functionality uh, to support multiple uh, and multiple mechanisms to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might have some routes that are via HTTP REST, some are via WebSocket, some are via uh, gRPC. It's actually kind of, it's actually, I'm, that's what I'm building right now. So it's, yeah, that's yeah. why I'm saying this can be done. The, the the bullet you have there on on managing infrastructure cost it has a lot of dollar signs so it caught my eye um it, and it's always the thing that kind of keeps my project my homegrown projects um you know running on my laptop rather than running on on aws uh, just fear that i'll i'll forget about them and i'll have a 500 hundred dollar bill at the end of the month how how do you um, or are there are there good mechanisms to monitor and and dynamically scale up as well as down based on utilization that you've seen employed? Uh, scale number of instances, yes. Uh, almost all AWS uh, mechanisms provide you a way with scale up and down, like Elastic Beanstalk and ECS and AKS. You can specify uh, your uh, scaling capacity, but that will imply only, apply only to your number of instances of the same uh, service. So you can specify those, or it, typically based on CPU utilization. Uh, it's a percentage of CPU utilization, AWS will increase, uh, will basically start up EC2 instances for you, or containers, depends what you're running, mm -hmm. and then scale them down uh, as CPU usage goes down. Uh, but you cannot do it for your data stores. So data stores, whichever you select, it's a set in stall unless you upgrade it, but that's a deliberate process to upgrade. Okay. So there is no way to uh, automatically or dynamically scale up and down uh, any data stores that I know of. So it can only apply to, to EC2 instances and containers. Okay. All right, so and at this point, robust CI CD is very important. Developers should have full confidence in uh, CI CD pipeline and not constant changes to production. Um, like I said in my last talk, if you deploy code once in a year, uh, you literally need to stop work for a month in order to make sure that your code is ready. But if you deploy code every day, then uh, it's like a muscle. It's essentially you build a muscle of being ready to deploy. It's also uh, forces you essentially to invest into your automation. Because if it's something that you are doing every day and you're a reasonable person, you don't want to do it manually. You don't want to do the same thing uh, outside of a button click every day. If it takes you whatever, 30 minutes every day, you don't want to do it 30 minutes every day. You want to spend such so a sense on it, like a button click or something. So that's why uh, uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment is very important. And so some of the features of robust CD performance, faster CICD, more often developers will deploy code, more features uh, will be added to your code base. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, the, uh, cloud and web, but the same things essentially apply to any engineering work. But your CICD pipeline, faster you can add features to your code base. So it has to be fully automated. Human interventions should be optional, but not required. And try to look on, uh, to develop automation over documentation. Sometimes people overthink documentation. Oh, I'll document that. Great, five steps. Why not to write a script to replace these five steps with a script? Uh, yes, documented five steps, but it's better to have a script. Uh, it needs to be built on uh, not notification on successes and failures and notification of what is actually being deployed. Sometimes it's not clear. Yeah, something was deployed. What was deployed? We need to uh, provide clear notifications, whatever, whatever notification system you are using. Uh, most commercial companies are using Slack these days, but I'm sure that you guys are probably most familiar with email. So if you're using email, that's fine. But whatever, whatever notification mechanism you are using, that's that should work. And uh, think about rollback. What if what you just deployed had issues, something failed, how are you gonna roll back? How are you gonna roll back to previous version? So if you have customers uh, who are relying on your uh, features so that they should have a way uh, to continue 
uh, using your services without interruption. That's why rollback is very important. So Vadim, that one, this, this one's like near and dear. Um, uh, in our industry, as I see teams and programs kind of jumping on the, the agile DevOps bandwagon, so to speak, I see them focusing on doing things like Scrum and I don't see them focusing on CICD, which to me is a hundred times more powerful um, as a as a technique than uh, than something like Scrum. Um, e even for actually showing progress, your your CI/CD, you can show um, commits to you know successful execution of a pipeline. Um, I, I see a lot of resistance. Um, whether it's just lack of knowledge or expertise in the in the, the the technique and technology, or whether it's some of this is seen as a threat to traditional roles, um, I'm wondering if as you moved into the commercial space, um, the how, what how, what do you see as a strategy that that businesses employ to really drive a uh, you know a focus on CICD and on driving that confidence in your CICD? Is it a business imperative? Uh, is it driven by leadership or management or is it more organic? I might give you the answer that I think, which might not be what you expect. Uh, I think it depends on engineers who are driving this. Um, uh, before going to commercial, I was working for LIDOS, and they also had very good uh, CICD pipelines based on Jenkins. So it depends because a uh, bunch of very good uh, young engineers from Georgia, Georgia, from Georgia Tech uh, developed those pipelines uh, because they didn't want to do things manually and to invest a lot of time and produce very good results. Mm -hmm. So it really comes, I don't think you can push from a manager. Well, I mean, from management, you can encourage people, but you should still have engineers who are willing to do it. Okay. Uh, I just, just another example, sorry. I just joined Fitch. I just spent a lot of time of building a Bitbucket pipeline. Again, nobody told me to do it, but I knew that um, for me to save me time later on, I have to have a robust CICD pipeline so that in the future I can spend more time on development versus uh, figuring out why my pipeline is broken or why my code is slow to deploy. Right. In terms of the topic of scaling, um, I think one of the challenges that, that I see is how you scale your pipeline, not, not just scale your system and how it deploys and operates, but um, if I decide I need to, to move from you know, 10 tests to a, to 1,000 tests to 100,000 tests, to achieve that confidence in my product. Um, can I apply similar, at least strategies, if not necessarily specific technologies to scale out my CICD? Definitely. Uh, what you can do right uh, this day is that you can run all your tests in parallel. Uh, that's, uh, again, it's, it's along the same, uh, the same notion of horizontal scaling. Uh, don't think about running uh, your integration tests, even if you have thousands of them. Uh, it can be thousand sequential tests that will take you forever, or it can be thousand processes running in parallel, and then it's one. Of course, you probably don't have thousand resources to do it, but think about batches. Uh, it, so it depends how much resources you have, how much dollars you can spend on those resources. And then it becomes a question of, time versus dollars because mm -hmm. the more resources you can uh, throw at the problem horizontally you can scale it uh, that's the more uh, bigger batches you can run of your, of your tests mm -hmm. and faster you can complete your pipeline and faster you can get feedback yeah exactly yeah okay thank you So horizontal scaling while uh, minimizing costs. So we built our services. We have uh, uh, good CI/CD going, assuming that we have everything great. Now, how are we gonna actually scale uh, our services while minimizing costs? And very important, take a look at the graph on the left. Uh, if you have a more technically scalable solution, 
then as number of users in, in the apps goes up, you can still maintain a better latency and error rate versus a less technically scalable solution. That's why it's always important to, to think in terms of like, what is, my, what is the best technical solution that I have right now uh, as you continue to grow? So that's why my next slide is about language choice and its effect on performance. So using high performance languages such as Golang, it allows you to have less instances and smaller containers running. Uh, I used to just grab the benchmark from, from the internet, the latest one, which shows that uh, Go's fast HTTP router is, uh, would require you to have 20% less hardware than uh, Java's uh, make router. So Go, for, for the cases of uh, web service, Go is a very good language in terms of performance. And if you would compare it to Ruby and Rails, and Python, then Go provides you with two and three X performance. Uh, of course, at the same time, Rust is now gaining popularity in certain use cases, such as WebAssembly, because it provides even better performance. The choice of language uh, becomes important. Uh, of course, for engineering applications, C, C++, there was a reason why C and C++ were selected. They provide very good performance. C will outperform Golang, uh, but at the same time, C requires uh, a longer time to develop your software. It does not have such good uh, package management that Golang does. Uh, Golang is essentially the next version of C. It was written by the same people even. So Rob Pike, he was one of the contributors to the C and uh, latest book on Golang was written by Kernigan. Uh, I'm, I'm so curious, Vadim, if you can, uh, the, the, when we talk about languages, at least in my experience in our, in mm -hmm. our industry, it almost turns into this religious argument. We, um, we, we, we find people who, who can invent a hundred reasons to stick with the language that they're most comfortable with. Um, I, I'm wondering, have you, have you found good ways to sort of quantify the value uh, objectively of a, of a language decision, one versus the other? Is, is flat out performance the best way to go necessarily? It's, for the com from the company's perspective, yes. Uh, in terms of convincing people, no. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, in order to try to explain people what the better language to use, it's not always an easy task. Mm -hmm. Um, Would a company not also be concerned with the uh, availability of engineers who know that language? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very valid point. Uh, um, it's a double-edged sword, too. You know, running the 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 language that's older than I am. I've certainly seen programs stuck in that quandary. And that's a, a very expensive proposition. But to Zalex's point, there is uh, another side of that sword. Uh, if it's a new language, uh, there are people, especially young engineers, uh, who are willing to learn it because it's, well, it looks good on the resume, but they also basically enjoy learning things. And if you can just kind of, you uh, provide basically an attractive environment for those people. Because everybody else has, uh, in the web space, everybody has Java.net, right? And if you look at any Huntsville uh, job, job offer, it's, it should be C++ Java. So if you have Golan, uh, then it's something that might attract people who are basically willing to learn, willing to try new things. So it's, it's, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. You can also look at it from that perspective, like, like in what he was talking about there with performance, right? It's, you know, maybe Java is good enough for a lot of things so you can keep things moving, but you switch pieces, parts of it over to Golang or something where you really drive and squeeze all the last performance. Of it, right? And then use that as a, as a driver, you know, as, as another wedge to kind of keep moving pieces, parts in the same way that you'd break apart and 
move from a micro or from a uh, monolith into a microservice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something which is not in your uh, high performance path, you don't have to uh, write in high performance language. Uh, for example, our AWS Lambdas, we write them in Python or Node.js. They are not, they are async processes. If it's executes in five seconds or three seconds, it's not a big deal. So you write them in something which is uh, very uh, easy to write in scripting language typically. But if it's in a hot path, which is by customers at 5,000 requests per second, you kind of have to write it in uh, something which is uh, high performant. Yeah. Yeah, good point. It does get you to the idea of um, a, a multiple language baseline, which I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. But, it uh, keep the focus on the right tool for their job. Yeah. 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 Forks very well with microservices, though, because with microservices, you don't really care uh, what your service. What, what language was used for your microservice? As long as it provides API that everybody is aware of and uh, just call. So microservices architecture is, is perfect for trying multiple uh, programming languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next thing in scale, very important. Uh, if you're still in the cloud, you have to use Redis, which is in-memory key value data store, which has all data resides in uh, services main memory. And it supports an order of magnitude, more operations and faster response times, which results, of course, in uh, fast performance uh, and average times, which are uh, often less than a millisecond and support for millions of operations per second. Uh, also has vast, vast variety of data structures to support, as well as uh, primary uh, replica architecture. And an interesting part of this primary replica is that primary replica can be, uh, for AWS can be between regions. So you can have your primary replica in uh, East region, for example, replicated to West automatically uh, using AWS uh, global test technology. So you can have the same data available in uh, multiple regions. Uh, which is of course asynchronous, so it's uh, not in the customer's path. And version feature uh, streams and pops up. So you can use your Redis data store uh, for sending data between uh, services as well. Uh, there is no limit on uh, package size and uh, performance is outstanding. So for example, if you wanna send uh, packets which are in megabytes or maybe even in gigabytes, you can send them via Redis streams and you're getting uh, basically crazy performance in milliseconds. Much faster even than you will be using any other mechanism. Uh, faster than using HTTP REST because with Redis you'll maintain uh, connection. So Vadim, in that context, I know one of the cost drivers of a cloud environment is, uh, is data transfer in and out. Um, if you're using Redis, and to your example, you're doing you know megabytes or gigabytes. Uh, as long as it's self-contained in the cloud, am I getting hit on uh, data transfer costs? You shouldn't be getting hit on a data transfer cost. Uh, assuming it's within your VPC, it should mm -hmm. be free to uh, send data to Redis. Redis themselves are very expensive. I mean, business well, very open term, but they are expensive. Mm -hmm. It depends on the size. The bigger the size, more expensive they become. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think you're not paying anything because it should be within your VPC. Okay, great, thank you. And if you wanna connect, let's say you wanna get data out of your VPC to your uh, local, I think you can uh, VPN, using VPN, and that still should be free, I believe. Uh, I believe AWS charges only when you go out of uh, your VPC. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So since we just talked about uh, Redis, it's very important to minimize uh, your primary data store access in the user workflow because uh, the whole goal of uh, the cloud architecture is reduced response time because it leads to 
happy customers, uh, less hardware to use, less dollars to spend. Uh, it reduces response time on user requests. And uh, of course, you have to shield your primary data store from increased workload because it's, it's, uh, it's physically on scale. So that can be achieved uh, in multiple ways. You can use Redis as a cache in front of your main data store and just hit, hit you in memory Redis. Uh, you can use Redis as your primary data store because it actually has backup capabilities. You can use RAM. Uh, sometimes people forget that RAM is so cheap these days that you can just add uh, more RAM and just stick data in there. And always consider synchronous updates of your primary and make your primary data store eventually consistent. Which brings us to the next slide, async update of the primary data store in data lake. So data lake is a storage of raw data that can be later used for analytics recovery and so on. Uh, one thing to note is needs to be kept out of operational workflow and updated via synchronous streams. It's the same thing applies, I mean, I'm talking about web service, but the same thing applies for for different applications as well. Uh, while you might have store your logs and so on in asynchronous ways, you don't want your log storage to be part of your operational workflow. It has to always to be asynchronous uh, and has no connection with your operations. Which brings a message event bus architecture, which can be implemented with so many ways. You can use SNS, Kinesis, Kafka, MQs. It's a great way to separate analytics and uh, long-term storage from real time. So in your real time, you process your request, is it from the sensor or from a web client, as fast as you can, but then you throw an event uh, or message to your message to event bus, which will later be picked up by your log storage, tracing solution, data lake, whatever you are using. That one brings up a question, Vadim. The, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one thing we, we often have in our uh, domain, uh, certainly in the defense domain, are requirements for things like open architecture. And those tend to be translated into, do you adhere to some, pick your favorite Corp. standards by, you know, an OMG um, mm -hmm. standard like DDS. Um, and that, of course, then drives you to certain solutions that usually are quite expensive and all these things. I, I'm curious, in the commercial world, um, when you think of open architectures and, and open solutions, um, how do you, when you look at, at, a, at, a, at a messaging or eventing bus, um, how do you characterize them or choose from the gazillion options out there? And is this uh, idea of open standards a, a big factor in your, or I should say formal standards, a big factor in your decision process? There are not, you'll be surprised, but there are not that many solutions. Like what I have is literally what there is, which is SNS, Kinesis, or Kafka. There are literally three. Some people are using uh, MQs of some sort, but uh, I would say MQs are much rare, like Rabbit MQs or whatnot, they're much rare. So in reality, you're actually, you're either gonna use SNS or you're gonna use Kafka. And Kinesis is a uh, Kafka version of AWS. <laughs> so once you have a choice of two, you just pick one of those, flip a coin. Yeah. Uh, they have each, each one of those have uh, pluses and minuses. Okay. So in this sense, it's actually good that there are standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two options. We'll do a trade study. We'll take six months to do it and we'll get a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and most importantly, build your uh, software that you can uh, switch back and forth. Yeah. And there is not that much difference between us. I mean, they're technically different architectures than so Kafka, but in terms of like building publisher and subscriber to them, that's not a lot of work. As long as you can uh, architecture your software in the right way, that your publishers and subscribers are uh, somewhat independent, you, you can uh, switch. Yeah, okay. So did that answer your question? It did, thank you. So, and then you have your uh, data lake, which is Snowflake, which is very popular, for example. Uh, have uh, consumers which actually can consume both SNS and Kafka. 
And the same, your microservices can send data to both SNS and Kafka. So you can run them in parallel. You don't even have to check, to choose actually. Like okay. I've done it before, you just send both events to both SNS and Kafka. Uh, load testing, very important. It's important to determine your system's behavior under both normal and anticipated peak load conditions. Uh, low cost is a very good tool uh, to perform load testing. It can be used for anything, essentially. Uh, like I used it recently for HTTP, but it can be used for web sockets. It probably can be used just to uh, load test in uh, engineering applications, which are not web-based. So uh, sockets can be uh, load tested with a low cost, I'm sure. Uh, so it's very important to load test. And one thing that developers often forget is uh, to load the existing uh, services. Developers typically load test when they create a new service. Before putting it into production, everybody typically load tests something. But as they keep adding more and more features, nobody load tests after that. So if you have a web service that has been in production for one or two years, you don't know what the load test characteristic of that service is, if uh, more features were added to it. And running load test is very important since well, allow on-call engineers to sleep better on weekends. So this one's an interesting one. It, it, it goes back, I won't tell the long story, but um, one of the first things I did as, a, as an engineer out of college was, was load testing. And the big challenge we had was, was how to emulate user behavior in a representational way. When you're doing load testing um, in, in your world, um, do you guys, do you have strategies to try to figure out ways to, to, to emulate realistic user interaction? Or do you just, you know, hammer it till it breaks kind of a thing so that you understand where your boundaries are? Typically hammer, from what I've seen people typically hammer. Um, you can hammer uh, uh, using, like Locust allows you to hammer using a uh, typical user interaction. For example, your web service provides five routes you can uh, split load test based on, on whatever you think the proportion is, uh, whatever your ratio is between those five routes. And then you just look up at the existing traffic, multiply it by 10 and put this number in low cost in order to get your desired uh, traffic, desired load for testing. Okay, thank you. Would you normally include uh... Um, some failure conditions in that load testing just to see how things break and cascade? Or or is this primarily just to kind of set your, your main baseline of, yeah, we can hit normal operations and, and some multiple over top of that? I've never seen people uh, trying exceptions during load testing. Uh, what you're asking is more for chaos engineering, which is, of course, a great thing. I have, have half a slide on this later on. Uh, but I've never seen people actually doing chaos engineering during load tests. Load tests are typically you hammer it until it breaks, I think. Okay, cool, thank you. But, but what you're saying is not wrong. I mean, there is nothing wrong with uh, uh, trying exceptions and see yeah. how system performs. Okay. And uh, as we were talking about load testing and building services and growing, you should never forget about security part of that setups uh, because security exposure can ruin any company. Even if you are growing, it doesn't matter. If you have a big security exposure, your company can literally go bankrupt overnight. That's why it's very important as, as you grow, uh, always think about security because bad actors are out there. They want to steal your data, your money. Uh, of course, I'm talking to government guys, but commercial have exactly the same issue. Um, because uh, account takeovers is a very big deal for any commercial companies. Uh, as a user in general, as a consumer, never use your passwords. Uh, I've been working some in the uh, security part of the company and uh, it's, it's so easy to break 
by, uh, it's, it's so easy to break into, uh, into the system by using your passwords if you are using your password. Uh, because there are password databases on the dark web from, let's say from LinkedIn uh, disaster about five years ago. So what they do, what people do, they just grab uh, usernames, uh, passwords from that LinkedIn uh, data file and just hammer uh, commercial service until one of them will succeed. Once they succeed, they in, and then they just try to steal money from you, essentially. Uh, that's why every engineer has to think about security uh, and how to improve it. Because security cannot be achieved by just rules, which can only be achieved by engineers thinking and practicing it. Uh, just at least just a few security practices. Of course, security is, as you know, it's a big topic on, on its own. So microservices needs to be in private VPC without public access because public exposure is for a microservice is typically a very uh, bad practice and a big deal. So only a gateway with a firewall which blocks, typically blocks uh, regional traffic. For example, if you're a US based company, you don't want to see traffic from Africa. It's typically uh, traffic that's just trying to steal your data. Uh, every call needs to be authenticated with a token public and private keys for those tokens. It needs to be constantly rotated. As much as you can uh, use two-factor authorization because passwords, people still do use them. Uh, but two factors are kind of not as easy to reuse and make it a requirement for your internal users for any services that you have internally. And if it's possible try to, uh, uh, some, to have some sort of authentication for your service to service calls, just to, uh, while the, your services are in VPC, there is still a chance that one of them might get accidentally exposed. And then again, hackers will have a good day of stealing your money and your data. This is a, an interesting one for me. The, make a plug for, if you if you haven't watched it on, our, on the website, there's a resources tab and it has a, uh, a video by John Willis who was with us in December called the uh, the divine and felonious nature of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it's a really neat kind of DevSecOps talk. Um, but, but Vadim, the question I have for you, and especially in your domain, um, I, I, I'm kind of interested to compare and contrast. It almost seems like in, in my world that security and engineering are, are, are natural enemies, right? They're the, they're the wildebeest, Right and the lion, and and they're they're gonna they're gonna you know someone's going down. Um, it, it, what's it like in the commercial world? And if it's if it's if it's better, if it's not this you know continuous conflict and natural enemies, um, how do you achieve that? Uh, good question. Uh, it's definitely as company grow. Smaller companies, typically security is not a big concern. As company grow, uh, security department will try to add more bureaucracy to their, uh, to engineers, which engineers are gonna hate. That's for sure. But I would put here, I would separate uh, two types of securities. So there is a security for internal services. Let's say leakage of uh, AWS password. That's something that your security department needs to worry about. And then there is a security concern of uh, customers accessing your services in unwanted way. That's where engineers are actually in charge more than security. Okay. Uh, so in your world, it's uh, the same way. So, because I've been in this new world, I had top tier security. Uh, in your world, Engineers sometimes are prevented from doing things. Literally, I mean, you don't, you're not allowed to have uh, admin password to your own uh, desktop. Uh, it helps maybe to uh, stop engineers from stealing data, but it doesn't help for, for let's say, uh, adversaries, let's say Chinese to access in that engineering computer. And that's where still engineers are responsible for, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I continue so to look for any good strategy yeah. to uh, to try to help 
um, kind of overcome that adversarial nature that, that we seem to see throughout our, 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 our industry. Um, get, get engineers more engaged in security, but make sure that security knows that uh, it, if they do things that prevent engineers from doing their job, then no one is getting value um, out of, uh, you know, to, to our end users. And that, that, that always seems to be an interesting challenge and a difficult thing to overcome. Yeah, that's true. And in the world, there is a little bit of bureaucracy and check mark. In commercial world, uh, it's very important to build security first culture, uh, which makes engineers, which puts engineers in charge of security rather than uh, make them enemy of security team. Mm -hmm. Because if you make them uh, enemies of security team, engineers will find a way to uh, gain access to the computer because they have to get the job done, right? right. They'll create loopholes one way or the other, which is not good neither for, uh, basically it's good it's for everyone. Right. Okay, great, thank you. So, as we talked about skin services and security and all of that, but what do we really do when uh, traffic suddenly goes up? And I actually seen such a uh, use case um, during, I believe it was actually during the president's speech in March, when, uh, it was closing the economy type speech, a number of orders and ships were literally going up exponentially, like during that speech. So it was very interesting to watch. Uh, and uh, so when your demand goes and demand as you would expect, the same thing happened for all other companies, Netflix, uh, Amazon, Target, they all experience outstanding demand uh, basically during uh, last couple of weeks or in March, I believe that's when it's happened. And then it's kind of tailed down since then. Um, so what you do is you literally burn money. Uh, you increase your number of containers because you assume that at this point you've built a robust system that can handle increasing number of containers with ease. Uh, increase instance sizes, you upgrade your bigger and faster radius instance. Like I said before, they are very expensive, but you don't have a choice. You just buy bigger and uh, faster radius instance. You spend more dollars on your SNS, SQS, Kafka, and so on messages. Uh, you increase your serverless Lambda budget. Start looking at replacing uh, Lambdas with workers. So workers are uh, processes that run continuously versus services lambda are something that run on demand. Uh, if you don't have uh, a lot of traffic, lambdas are better, they're cheaper. Uh, but once you hit with a lot of traffic, it's much cheaper to have a continuous process that does the same thing, processing those messages. And you also realize that any piece of your infrastructure that depends on pay per request, and those are uh, AWS gateways, Buff as a uh, AWS firewall, uh, X-ray, DynamoDB on demand, and so on. They now cost you a small fortune, and you basically need to start planning on replacing it. Otherwise, you just literally run out of money. Mm -hmm. uh, then question comes in: When to do it? Because if you start doing it prematurely, then you're going to spend more money on your cloud resources beyond the need of supporting your customers. That's why you have to have uh, utilization alerts uh, and they need to be set to proper values for, your, for basically for all your data stores, queues, services, so that uh, when it happens, you're aware that it happens and you need to start working on mitigating it. Uh, service run books needs to be out in advance and um, basically it's a plan of action. Run book is a plan of action, what to do if this thing happens. And they need to be tested in the staging environment. Uh, of course, best plan is only as good as you've tested it. Uh, if you think that you wrote a great run book without testing it, it's not gonna work. And there was a question uh, earlier on about chaos engineering. So yes, chaos engineering, very important. It needs to be run on there. Uh, it needs to be a regular practice. So chaos engineering is when you literally just, uh, in your staging environment, go ahead and turn off your radius, turn off your desktop. And, and, and don't tell me how you're gonna recover it. Just go and recover it. 
just pull cables, but in cloud environment, essentially. By the way, JD, I remember your talk, you, you, you talk about that when you said that you literally pulled the cable out in, in the instance. That was very good. I liked it. It was, uh, yeah, and a, and a Oracle support contract. And six months later, we decided that the, uh, the, the product was working as designed and there was nothing that could be done to correct it. <laughs> that was the day we got rid of the uh, Oracle Enterprise DB solution. <laughs> Yeah, so don't, yeah, don't trust what it says. Only trust what it actually does. <laughs> and in yeah. Let me just go, go back, because it, 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 this is, you know, your, your cartoon really kind of highlights it uh, to some extent, but it, it, it brings up something I've been looking into lately, and I'm curious how you look at it from a commercial perspective. Uh, you know, we are uh, in, a, in, a, in a secure world, we are just now kind of, I'd say, dipping our toes in the cloud and uh, trying to figure out how that works. And I've been trying to look at the cost models associated with that and the return on investment of the transition. And at least initially, it looks like it's, if it's not tens of millions, it's hundreds of millions of, of dollars in savings. But but as I look at, you know, as I look at some of the content here and some of your experience and what you, you've presented, I, I get the sense that it's, a, it's also a risk that if you do it wrong, um, you're going to be, you, you, you know, you're going to be really hit hard um, on, on the budgetary side. Are there, are there, is that your experience and, and are there good strategies or good resources that we could, uh, could take advantage of to learn how to do cloud, not only technically right, but affordably? Very good question. Are you looking at uh, specific cloud providers like AWS or Azure or Google? Um, the ones I see that support our domain are going to be AWS and Azure. Uh, for AWS, I subscribe to a newsletter. I'll, I can send you a link uh, after the meeting. I think it's last week in AWS. The guy provides very good resources on uh, how to handle uh, cost increases for AWS and basically good advice. Okay. He by himself is a, a consultant in reducing AWS costs. Uh, you definitely have to pay attention to what's going on with uh, your resources. Uh, there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, you can uh, write this. I mean, there are uh, uh, examples on the web, but you can write your own as well. A uh, very simple script which will go over your resources and just send you uh, a list of what you have. And then you just say, hey, this is wrong. Something doesn't look right. Basically, if you're looking at the same thing every week, uh, then you can uh, easily spot change that you wouldn't expect. And then yes, mentally you have to convert that change into dollars. So you have to continuously look into that. AWS provides some resources, but not that good. Yeah. Uh, that's why uh, there are open source tools and you can extend those open source tools to help you with uh, your costs. Okay. Hey, you mentioned uh, uh, testing in the staging environment in, in this one. Do you guys typically try to have a staging environment that's scaled to the same level as production, or are you at running at like a percentage of that? Because because typically in, in a lot of our environments, you know, there's the desire to have a, you know, a final test environment that's you know a dual mirror or mirrored image of what would be a production type of environment, and you know that certainly drives a tremendous amount of cost as well. Yeah, one thing which you can do with the cloud and uh. I've done it is, uh, for example, if I want to load tests, I can scale my staging environment to the level that I need it and then scale it down. That's something that it's not, might not be as easy to do if you're running it on, on premise. Uh, but this cloud is very easy. So for load tests, I intentionally scaled it up many times and then scaled it down for regular operations. Uh, does it has to make a uh, production environment? You know, it's, it's a good question. I thought a lot about that. An ideal world, maybe, 
much. In reality, you're gonna pay a lot of extra, which might not be worth it. So you, you definitely need to have the same code, uh, the same everything, except that uh, instance types. So for example, if my, uh, let's say Redis instance type uh, will be R5 large or X large in production, maybe I can get away with stiff micro in staging. And if I wanna run load tests, I can always spin up a new R5 X large to load test, then take it down and switch back to T3 micro. Uh, I've seen it both ways. There is no right or wrong. It just, does it really worth the money? I don't know. Like overnight, nobody's using it, right? And it's there. Sure. Yeah, I think that, that's one of the things where you have to get, um, probably kind of goes back to your uh, earlier slide about getting confidence in your CI CD pipeline, right? If, if you've got sufficient tests in there from a loading perspective, you know, then, you know, that can probably make it easier to look at and say, yeah, we don't need a, full size uh, staging environment because we have enough confidence in these other things that we've done that we should be able to meet things at, at scale or at, at large in operations and stuff. So it, this kind of goes back to what's your, uh, probably your risk tolerance in terms of ability to release versus, uh, you know, the level of testing and, you know, and, and how close you are in, in those two environments. But, okay, thank you. That means your staging should definitely match your production in everything except maybe the uh, instance size. So don't don't get me wrong. You still have should have the parity between production and staging. Instance size yeah. is the only one which I'm not so sure that it was the money. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So conclusion, last slide. Uh, so cloud computing provides great ability to make your services up and running quickly without infrastructure yeah. investment. Yeah. Do you ever? Um... Do you ever find yourself attempting to uh, characterize any metrics like uh, the, the the infrastructure cost associated with, you know, either the number of users, but but maybe more particularly the types of operations that they're performing, so that you can quantify, uh, you know, the value of um, breaking off a particular piece to address a bottleneck, or or, or you not know, challenged to uh, to do that. So are you attempting to gather metrics from either your, your runtime environment or your staging environment to, uh, to, to, to make the business case for, you know, building, you know, buying down technical debt? Yeah, good question. In reality, what I've seen, it's uh, in terms of costs, it was like you spend as much as you want or you don't spend at all. It's almost like a buy. It's not. It's business has money, business does not have money type thing. Um, justification uh, that you are talking about, I've seen for mostly for third party vendors, not for internal resources. Um, like if you have a third party and it provides you X resources for, for Y value, that's where justification typically comes into play. Um, Justification for infrastructure cost per user. I'm not sure that I've seen that. Because for, as an engineer, you might not even know what per user means. You know only what per request means. And then uh, then you have either your user is a paying customer or not, you don't know. That's business metrics. Can you please classify? Uh, did you, uh, am I answering your question, Evan? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I mean, I, it was basically for certain types of operations, I, I would think would drive it, or at least be easier to derive the the cost association. Uh, so thanks. All right. So horizontal scaling is the only way to uh, scale uh, to increase demand, and engineers definitely need to build systems that can scale horizontally. And as we just talked, continuous review and search for solutions to reduce cost is always required. Otherwise, you're gonna have a risk of bankruptcy. And I created this memo, I just kind of like, since people like to see uh, polar bears, maybe I can encourage more people to stop uh, 
uh, leave unused AWS resources by looking at polar bears. I have a couple of things I'm curious about here. The, the, the horizontal scaling, um, and we, we kind of talked about how that's really, for all in practical purposes, uh, unlimited. Um, how quick is it? If I need to be able to scale in, you know, 10 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever, um, can I get performance and scaling um, uh, as well as capacity? Yeah, that actually depends on what uh, services I are running. We just ran numbers for Elastic Beanstalk uh, to bring up another, uh, which requires you to uh, bring up another EC2 instance, takes about a minute and a half. Okay. Uh, if you're running containers like ECS or EKS or your own Kubernetes, that can be much faster. That's why containers is a better solution because uh, spinning up a new container is much faster than bringing up another uh, EC2 instance because you can spin up another container uh, and deploy it to an existing EC2 instance. Okay, awesome. So that really and of course, for, to, uh, yeah, but for data, for data I just well, say, that you, drives you to a yeah. deployment strategy that you have to decide on up front. That'll be a key factor in that uh, strategy. Yeah. And uh, data stores, of course, they don't scale automatically at all. If you want to scale up your radius, that's something that you need to plan in advance. Yeah. It's okay. a manual operation. Uh, the same for any, any database scaling is going to be a manual operation. It's only in number of instances that you can scale automatically. Or containers. Yeah, I, I think you've answered all my questions. This I got a lot out of this, Vadim. I was I've been looking forward to this for for a few days now um, since we kind of did the peer review of the <laughs> the package. Um, I, I hope everyone else got any got got some value out of this. Um, I, I do want to open it up and and ask anybody if they have any comments or questions about the about the topic, about scaling, or about uh, you know, what scaling means uh, to you, uh, what you might get out of it, or, or where you th see challenges. I had a quick question about the BFF. Um, so it kind of sounded like uh, you were almost describing uh, like uh, GraphQL, little, where um, it'll take uh, you know, several different resources, and um, or what, what could be several different requests Group them together into a single uh, response. Um, is 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 that kind of what you're describing, or were you describing were you describing a totally different, uh, uh, I guess, functionality? Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Uh, so GraphQL is um, you build functionality into your backend to allow your front end to query your backend service, right? All back engineers, all backend engineers hate GraphQL. All front engineers love it. That's the technology that Facebook developed essentially. Uh, uh, what backend for front end is, is uh, ability to call multiple services in order to build uh, one page on your screen, which is exactly what GraphQL is. GraphQL is just one example of BFF, backend for front end. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, awesome, any other questions? Well, Vadim, good job. That was a great presentation. Um, Thank you. I really appreciate you, uh, you know, volunteering your time and putting the putting the the material together. Um, I, I continue to think that uh, that our our industry and our domain has more to learn from the commercial world than we even recognize today. And uh, to 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 have you come and speak to us about your experience in both worlds and. Uh, give us some ideas of, of where we need to be focused and learning. I think absolutely great. So really appreciate you. Thank you.